All right, I'm pleased to be joined now by Dr. Tyrone David, who many of you and should all of you should know. Tyrone, you're premier surgeon. You've also you. been past president of the AATS in 2005. Yes, I have. Yeah. Okay, so I, I come prepared to the interview with a paper, <laughs> your recent paper in circulation, which is a fabulous paper. Tell me a little bit about this paper. We, we have an interest in valve repair. It started very early in my career. Actually, I. As soon as I finished my residency, I, I uh, worked with Carpo and Chief for a, as a traveling fellow. And I came back to Toronto and he started repairing mitral valves. So from uh, the moment I learned to repair, which took a few years, and, and this paper goes back to 1985, when really I, I was comfortable in repairing mitral valves. So the learning curve had been uh, eliminated. I, I started following the patient prospectively. It's a cohort of some 840 patients that we, we kept a personal tab on them. So we knew what's happening over the past 26 years. So I thought it was time to uh, put this down and, uh, and came down to this paper. So it's, uh, actually, it's uh, 80, 840 patients, but every single one was followed prospectively. So it's, it's incredible. So you followed we, them through. We lost six patients. They moved back to Europe and couldn't track them so down. Over 800 but, uh, patients followed for over 20 for years. For 26 years. It's yeah. incredible. So the obvious question is, what'd you find? Well, first of all, repair is a durable procedure. It doesn't resolve the problem. Like anything else we do, it doesn't cure the disease, but uh, it palliates very well. Uh, the, uh, the risk of reoperation at 20 years was very low. Only 6% of them require a second operation after mitral valve repair. That's incredible. However, many more develop mitral insufficiency and or some degree of mitral stenosis late after repair. Interesting. Indicating that if the myxomatous process is progressive and stiff in the valve, or panels perhaps, like in some patients, they require reoperation because of mitral stenosis due to panels Interesting. caused by the uh, foreign device in the mitral animals. The vast majority, however, did very well. When, so so um, the, the reoperation rate is staggering, but that's, you know, obviously has to do with excellent surgical technique and learning. But, but what, uh, in, but the, in remember, we, we, we have, I started practicing in 1978. I didn't count the seven, first seven years right, because right, I'm so. sure if I had uh, included the first seven years. So you took your learning curve. Absolutely. Uh, when I was comfortable with repair, I could repair both anterior or posterior lift or both we put in this study. What about freedom from MR? You said MR comes back it, in. It, only 38 patients out of uh, 840 develop severe MR okay. to warrant reintervention or they die from it if they're too old and uh, are not operable. But uh, a total of 98 patients develop some degree of uh, significant MR, either moderate or severe. Some of the moderate require reoperation as well, either because of uh, symptoms or we have to be in the heart from some other reason, so we repair the valve again. But so the, the, or replace it. But, but it's a small percentage is what well, you're very, very low. Very, very low, so, yes. So, Tyrone, what's this mean for, you know, surgeons trying to learn how to do this or learning how to do this? What's, I mean, what's, what's the lesson well, to them? It is an operation worthwhile learning because it's durable. It certainly is more durable than anything else you have available for mitral valve disease. I'm talking about degenerative mitral valve disease. Right, right. It's exclude the rheumatics, right, exclude the right. functional cardiomyopathy, ischemic, which are entirely different disease. I'm not so sure mitral valve repair in those cases are as important as mitral valve repair for uh, degenerative disease. Let me read you where your, your conclusion in here. You said, um, the findings support the recommendation of early mitral valve repair in patients with severe MR and normal ventricular function regardless of symptoms. That's an important point that uh, when we did the multivariable analysis by parametric right. methods, so of multivariable using a variable that changed over the years, uh, we found that uh, Ventricular function, even minimal impairment, the ejection fraction of 50%, was detrimental to survival. And functional class two, advanced functional class, class three and four are detrimental to survival as well. I mean, I think and the difference is sudden death and heart failure. Really? Those patients have a much higher rate of uh, sudden death after mitral valve repair 
en con Jess Hartsfield. I mean, the, the current American guidelines and even the European guidelines are waiting for the ventricles to get big and no, the EFs to go late. down, atrium to get big. I mean, you you know, the the ventricles getting damaged with this process as is uh, the atrium. Absolutely. So, so when do we operate on asymptomatic patients with primary degenerative severe MR? I think if the sonography can tell me that the mitral regurgitation is indeed severe, and uh, that's not always simple to, uh, no, no, to diagnose, and particularly moderate to severe, that I, I, I would leave a patient alone if the patient has a normal ventricular function, no symptoms, and really moderate MR. I think it's worthwhile to wait a bit longer. Agree. Observe every year, mm -hmm. but wait. But the more it becomes severe, and the valve is indeed repairable, I think our operation should be done electively. And it carries an extremely low mortality and morbidity. We, uh, for another presentation this afternoon, I had to look at my uh, most recent 1300 mitral valve repairs from 2000 until 2012. And only one patient died, and he was in shock, intractable heart failure, and so renal failure when I operated on him. So death after mitral valve repair is very, very low. It's certainly much lower than 1%. Now, there are problems. Like in open heart surgery, you have to be a bit cautious to start cutting everyone. Right, and, uh, right, right. I mean, you got yeah, obviously, you got to know what you're doing. The Jim Gammy's paper on pulmonary hypertension, I mean, I'm a big proponent of exercise testing in people who are asymptomatic. I think it's a severe. superb idea, yes. yes. In, if the peer pressure rise above 45, 50, I think you should, uh, it's but, an indication that uh, pulmonary venous circulation are very compliant, so should be operating them. But what you're telling me from both this paper and the paper you're going to come in and your experience and more recent experience is that if done well, this is a very durable operation. Procedure, absolutely. It gives people good quality of life? Most of them are symptomatic. 80% at 20 years have no symptoms. It's still class one, which is uh, quite remarkable. Well, you know, we, we all appreciate not only your expertise, but your expertise in educating us. Thank you very much for visiting with Thank us. Thank you for having me. Good to see you. Thank you.